Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Norton. I have the pleasure of being joined by someone who I think is one of the most important economists in the world, Michael Hudson. And I should say that we should wish Professor Hudson a happy birthday. Birthday Today is March 14th. It's his birthday, and he turns 84 today. How do you feel, Michael? Uh, just like I feel every other day. I usually feel uh, energetic on my birthday because I'm always working on a new chapter and I tend to write a lot uh, around this period each year. And Michael is extremely pro prolific. He has so many books. And today we're going to be talking about a lot of topics that he addressed in one of his classic books, which is Killing the Host and talking about how the financial sector is parasitic for the real economy. And we're, today we're going to be talking about the banking crisis that we see unfolding in the United States. This March, three banks have collapsed in the span of one week. It started at first with a California-based cryptocurrency-focused bank, Silvergate, which collapsed on March 8th. And then two days later, the Silicon Valley Bank went down as well. It went down in the largest ever bank run. And... That was the second biggest ever to fail in U.S. history. And it was the, also the largest bank to crash since 2008. Silicon Valley Bank had $209 billion in assets compared to the largest ever bank failure, which was Washington Mutual, which had $307 billion in assets. And that was in 2008. So Professor Hudson has been writing about this. He already has two articles that he published. And um, I have them over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. I'll link to them in the description below. The first is why the U.S. banking system is, is breaking up. So, uh, Michael, let's just start with your basic argument of why you think these banks have been crashing, first Silvergate, then Silicon Valley Bank, and why you think they're crashing and what the response of the Federal Reserve has been. Well, in order to understand why they're crashing, you have to compare it to what happened in 2008 and 2009. Uh, this crash is much more serious. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, Washington Mutual collapsed because it was a crooked bank. It was writing fraudulent mortgages, junk loan mortgages. It should have been allowed to go under because uh, uh, of the fraud. And uh, uh, the uh, basic uh, subprime fraud uh, and collapse uh, was uh, widespread th fraud throughout the whole financial system. Uh, Citibank was, and, uh, was one of the worst uh, offenders uh, countrywide, uh, uh, Bank of America. Uh, the, uh, these were individual banks that could have uh, been uh, allowed to go under and uh, the mortgages uh, could have done what uh, President Obama had promised to do. The mortgages could have been written down to the realistic market values uh, that would have uh, been cost about as much to service as paying your monthly rent. And uh, you just would have got the crooks out of the system. My colleague, Bill Black at the University of Missouri at Kansas City described uh, uh, all this and uh, uh, the best way to rob a bank is to own one. So uh, the problem then in uh, the uh, under the Obama administration was he said uh, he made an about face and reversed everything that he had promised uh, his voters. Uh, he had promised to write down the loans uh, to keep uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, subprime uh, mortgage people in their houses, but to write down the loans to the fair value and undo the fraud. Uh, what happened instead was uh, as soon as he was uh, took office, he invited the bankers to uh, the White House and said, I'm the only guy standing between you and uh, the mob with the pitchforks. The mob with the fit pitchforks, uh, he meant mainly black and Hispanic buyer, buyers, uh, mortgagees, who were the main uh, uh, victims of the subprime fraud. And uh, he bailed out the banks and directed the Fed to undertake 15 years of quantitative easing. Uh, and what that was, was the Fed said, well, uh, the mortgages uh, of uh, are worth less than uh, the, uh, the 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 value the value of the property doesn't su suffice to cover uh, all of the bank deposits because uh, uh, the banks have made bad mortgages. How do we save the banks that have uh, uh, misrepresented 
the value of what they have. We're going to slash interest rates to zero. We're going to uh, spur the largest uh, asset price inflation in history. We're going to uh, put $9 trillion into uh, supporting bank credit uh, and flooding the market with credit so that uh, instead of real estate prices going back to an affordable level, we can make them even more unaffordable. And that will make the banks much richer. It'll make the 1% in the financial sector much richer. It'll make the landlords much richer. Uh, we're going to do that. And so they they spurred uh, the uh, by lowering the interest rates, they created the biggest bomb, uh, bond market boom in American history, uh, from high interest rates in 2008 all the way down to almost uh, uh, zero. So uh, the result, of course, was an inflation in stock prices, an inflation of bond prices, and uh, the result was widening inequality for Americans uh, because uh, you you had uh, most stocks and bonds are owned by the wealthiest 10%, uh, not by the bottom 90%. So uh, if you were one of the 10% of the population that owned stocks and bonds, you were your wealth was going way up. If you were a part of the 90%, uh, your wages were not going up. And in fact, your living standards were being squeezed, uh, not only by the inflation, uh, but by the fact that more and more of your income had to go to paying rent and interest uh, uh, to the fire sector. Well, finally, uh, a year ago, the Federal Reserve said, well, uh, there, there's a problem. Now that uh, we have the COVID over, wages are beginning to rise. Uh, we've, got to imp uh, we've got to have 2 million Americans thrown out of work in order to lower wages so that the, co uh, the companies can make larger profits to pay higher stock prices. Because if we don't cause unemployment, if we don't uh, lower the wage levels for America, then profit levels will go down and stock prices will go back down. And our job at the Fed is to increase stock prices, increase bond prices, and increase real estate prices. So finally, they begin to uh, raise uh, wage rates to, as they put it, uh, curb inflation. When they said inflation, what they mean is rising wages. And even though wages have uh, gone up, they have not gone up as much as the uh, uh, consumer prices have gone up. And the consumer prices have gone up, not because of wage pressures, but for two reasons. Uh, one, the uh, sanctions against Russia have sharply increased the price of energy because uh, Russian oil can't be uh, sold to the West anymore, and Russian agriculture can't be sold to the West anymore. Uh, and also, there's been, uh, the uh, 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 Democratic Party uh, has followed the Republican Party in deregulating monopolies. The mon uh, Every... Uh, a monopolized sector of the economy has been raising its prices without its costs going up at all. Uh, it, and they've raised the prices because they say, well, we're raising them because we expect inflation to go up. Well, that's a euphemism for saying we're raising them because we can and we can make more money by raising them. So the prices have, have gone up, uh, uh, but the Fed is using this as an excuse to try to create unemployment. Well, uh, what has happened is that uh, by solving the problem of uh, wages rising, they've also created a problem that spilled over into the financial sector, because what they've done is uh, reverse the whole uh, asset price inflation from 2009 uh, to uh, just last year. That's uh, of almost a 13-year uh, uh, steady asset price inflation. By raising the interest rates, all of a sudden, they've put uh, downward pressure on uh, the bonds. So the bonds that went way up in price when interest rates are falling, now they go down in price because if you have a, uh, uh, a higher uh, uh, yielding bond available, uh, the price of your low yielding bond falls so that it works out to, to yield uh, exactly the same. Well, also, there's been uh, a withdrawal of money uh, from uh, the banks in the last year for obvious reasons. Uh, the banks are uh, the most monopolized sector of the American economy. Despite the fact that interest rates were going up, despite the fact that banks were making much more money on their loans, they were paying depositors only 0.2%. Uh, and imagine, uh, why would, uh, if you are a fairly 
well-to-do person and you have a, a, a retirement uh, income or a pension uh, plan, or if you've just saved a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, you, can, you can take your money out of the bank where you're getting almost no interest at 0.2% uh, and you can buy a, a two-year treasury note that yields 4% or 4.5%. So uh, bank deposits were being drained by people saying, uh, uh, I'm going to put my money uh, in uh, safe government securities. Many people also were selling stocks because they, they thought that the stock market was as high as it could go, and they bought government bonds. Well, uh, what, what happened then is that uh, uh, the uh, all of a sudden, the banks... Uh, especially uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, found themselves in a squeeze. And here's what happened. Uh, the Silicon Valley Bank and uh, banks all around uh, throughout the country were flooded by deposits uh, ever since uh, the uh, 2020 uh, COVID crisis. And that's because uh, people were not borrowing to invest corp uh, very much. Corporations were not borrowing. What they were doing was building up uh, their cash. Uh, Silicon Valley's deposits uh, were growing very, very rapidly. And it was only paying 0.2% on the deposits. And it, how was it going to make a profit? Well, it tried to make squeeze every little bit of profit that it could out by buying uh, long-term government bonds. Uh, the longer term a bond is, the higher the interest rate is. And even though long-term government bonds were only yielding, let's say, 1.5%, maybe one and three quarters percent, uh, they they uh, took the deposits that they were paying 2% on and uh, lent them out at one and a half, one and three quarters percent. And they were getting, it's called arbitrage, the difference between what they had to pay for their uh, deposits and what they were able to make by investing them. Well, here's the problem. Uh, they, uh, As the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, that meant the value of these long-term bonds, the market market price uh, steadily fell. Well, most people who saw this coming, um, every uh, CEO that I know uh, sold out of stocks, sold out of long-term government bonds, and they said when uh, the Federal Reserve head uh, said that he was going to raise interest rates, that means you don't want to hold a long-term bond. You want to keep your money as close to cash as possible. You want to keep it in three months treasury bills. Uh, that's very liquid because uh, short term treasury bills, money market funds, you don't lose uh, any uh, 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 capital uh, value in that at all. But uh, the Silicon Valley Bank thought, well, they were still after every little bit of extra uh, that uh, they could get. And they held on to their long term bonds that were plunging in price. Well, uh, what you have was uh, in a, was a miniature of what was happening for the entire American banking system. I have a chart on that that you can show on the uh, the fact the uh, uh, the the market value of the securities that banks hold. Now, uh, when banks report to the Federal Reserve, that's exactly it. When they report. They, uh, th th this shows the actual market value. Uh, if they, if banks uh, valued their assets at what they were worth on the market, they would have plunged just like you see uh, at, at uh, 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 the bottom there. Uh, but banks don't have to do that. Banks are allowed to uh, represent their assets according to the book value that they paid for them. So Silicon Valley Bank and other banks throughout the system have been carrying all of their long-term mortgage loans, package mortgages, uh, government bonds uh, at uh, the price they paid for them, not the declining market price. Uh, and so uh, th they figured, well, we can ride this out and you know hold it to maturity in 25 years as long as nobody in the next 25 years actually withdraws their money from the bank. Uh, and it's only when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, bank customers and depositors pull their money out that they decide that, uh, uh, wait a minute, now in order to raise the cash, to pay the depositors for the money they're taking out, we have to sell these bonds that we've uh, and mortgages that we've bought, and we have to sell them at a loss. 
and uh, so uh, the the bank began to sell the uh, bonds and the packaged mortgages at a huge loss, and uh, uh, they were losing capital. Well, uh, the as it happens, that uh, Silicon Valley Bank isn't a normal bank. A uh, normal bank you think of as having uh, mom and pop depositors, individuals, uh, wage earners, uh, but almost all the deposits, I think uh, uh, over 80 percent of the deposits in Silicon Valley Bank were by uh, companies, uh, mainly uh, high tech uh, companies that were sponsored by private capital, special purpose uh, uh, private capital acquisitions. And uh, they began to talk among each other. And uh, 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 some of them uh, decided, well, let's be, uh, uh, it looks to me like uh, the bank's being squeezed. Let's, let's pull our deposits out of uh, the small bank and put them in a big bank like uh, Chase Manhattan or uh, Citibank or any of the big banks that the government says are too big to fail. So you know that their money will be safe there. So there was a run on deposit. So the the problem that uh, that Silicon Valley Bank and other banks have is not that they'd made bad loans. It's not that they had uh, committed any fraud. It's not that the uh, uh, U.S. government couldn't pay the bills. It's not that the mortgagers couldn't pay the bills. It was that the uh, the market price of these good loans to solvent enter, uh, solvent enter entities had uh, gone down and left the bank illiquid. Well, that is uh, the what is uh, squeezing the entire financial sector right now. So just as uh, the quantitative easing was uh, uh, flooding the economy with, uh, with enough credit to inflate asset prices for real estate stocks and bonds, the uh, tightening of credit lowered uh, the access uh, asset prices for bonds certainly for real estate too for some reason the uh, stock market is not followed through and people say well there is an informal government plunge protection team that's artificially keeping the stock market uh, high but how long can it really be kept high uh, uh nobody really knows so the problem is that uh the 2009 crisis wasn't a systemic crisis but now uh, the rising uh, interest rates have created a systemic crisis because uh, the banks, uh, by the Federal Reserve, by saving the banks' uh, uh, balance sheets, by uh, inflating uh, the prices for uh, capital assets, by saving the wealthiest 10% of the economy from losing uh, any of their money, by solving that problem, they've uh, boxed themselves into a corner. They cannot let interest rates rise without making the entire economy look like Silicon Valley Bank, uh, because that's the problem. They've uh, uh, the the assets that banks hold are uh, are stuck. Now, a number of people have said, "Well, uh, why didn't the banks, uh, uh, if they couldn't uh, cover their deposits?" Why didn't they do what banks did uh, in 2009? And in 2009, the bank, uh, 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 Citibank, uh, Chase, uh, all the big banks uh, bar, uh, went to the Federal Reserve and uh, they did uh, sort of uh, repo uh, deals. Uh, they would uh, pledge uh, their securities and the Fed would lend them money against their securities. This wasn't uh, a creation of money. None of this quantitative easing appeared as an increase in the money supply. It was all done by balance sheet uh, manipulation. And uh, the uh, the banks are able to go to the Fed, or uh, instead of selling the bonds, people said, why couldn't Silicon uh, Valley Bank simply uh, borrow short-term money? Uh, you want to pay uh, the depositors? Okay, borrow the money, you know, pay the uh, 4%, but don't sell, you know, it's not going to last for very long. Uh, once the Fed sees uh, how systemic the problem is, they'll certainly uh, uh, turn out to be cowards and roll back the interest rates to what they they were. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, if uh, the the repo market, in other words, uh, the repo is the repossession. It, it's the market that uh, banks go to if they want to borrow from a larger banks. So you want to borrow overnight credit. Uh, you want to borrow from the Federal Reserve. But if you borrow in the repo market, uh, the bankruptcy law uh, was changed uh, uh, in order to uh, protect 
these sort of non-bank lenders. In or, and it was changed so that if a bank uh, makes a currency swap, if it says, here is, uh, I'm going to give you a uh, uh, billion dollars worth of packaged uh, government uh, bonds, and uh, you'll give me a loan. If the bank then goes under uh, and becomes insolvent, as Silicon Valley does, the uh, the bonds that have pledged for repo are not available uh, uh, to be grabbed by the uh, uh, the bank itself and the, to make the depositors whole. Uh, the repo uh, banks, uh, the large banks, are made whole because uh, Congress said. Well, <coughs> We have a choice. Either we can make the economy rich or we can make uh, the banking sector rich. Who gives us our campaign contributors? The banks. Uh, to hell with the economy. We're going to make we're going to make sure the banks don't lose the money uh, and that the one percent that own the banks don't lose money. We'd rather the voters lose the money because that's how democracy works uh, in America. So uh, the result is that uh, the, uh, uh, the there was a lot of pressure uh, against uh, Silicon Valley trying to uh, protect itself in the way that uh, banks were able to do back in 2009. All they did was uh, uh, sacrifice themselves, was sell the, uh, the existing uh, uh, securities they had in order to uh, pay the depositors before they were closed down on Friday afternoon, before closing hours. Uh, and uh, that led them in uh, the problem today before uh, uh, President Biden decided to bail them out and then uh, blatantly lied to the public uh, uh, by claim, it, claiming it's not a bailout. And how can it not be a bailout? He bailed out every single uninsured depositor because they were his constituency. Silicon Valley is a Democratic Party stronghold, as most of California is. And uh, there's no way that Biden and the uh, Democratic Party was going to let any wealthy person in Silicon Valley lose a penny of their deposits because it knows that it's going to get huge campaign contributions in gratitude uh, for the 2024 election. So uh, the result is that, uh, of course, they bailed out the banks and uh, uh, President Biden weaseled his way out of things by saying, well, we didn't bail out the bank stockholders. We only bailed out the uh, billions of dollars of, uh, uh, of depositors. It's very revealing to see how the financial press treated Silicon Valley Bank. In fact, just before, on the eve of it imploding, Forbes described uh, SVB as one of America's best banks in 2023. And that was for five years straight, praising this bank. And I think it's important to go look at SVB's website and to see how it portrayed itself, what, what it was boasting of. If you go to the Silicon Valley Bank website, they say they boast that 88% of Forbes 2020 next billion dollar startups are SVB clients. Around 50% of all U.S. venture capital backed tech and life science companies bank with SVB. And in fact, just before it imploded, 56% of the loans that SVB had made were to venture capital firms and private equity firms. And if you go down on their website, they, they boast up to 4.5% annual percentage yield on deposits, which is incredible. I mean, most banks offer 0.2% yield. SVB wrote on their website, they say, help make your money last longer with our startup money market account. Like wow. with the savings account, you'll earn up to 4.5% annual percentage yield on deposits. Uh, up to... Uh, I, I could say, why don't they say up to 50% a year? <laughs> yeah. You know, you could say anything you want. Uh, obvious, I think on this case, they were uh, looking at uh, 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 capital gain. They were factoring capital gains into it. That means asset price gains. Uh, it, this wasn't a uh, income yield uh, so much. It was a overall yield on uh, 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 it, uh, making the depositors uh, part of the uh, mutual speculation. But the depositors, we know that 80% uh, were people like Peter Thiel. Uh, they were uh, uh, large uh, 
private capital firms. And one of the problems is uh, if you have a lot of uh, well-connected uh, rich people uh, who are uh, your ma the major depositors that they're talking to in this case, they talk to each other. And they and when they see that there's no way that the bank can pay them for anywhere near 4.2% anymore, they jump ship. And that's exactly what happened. They talked to each other and there was a run on the bank. Now, most people think of a run of the bank of being, uh, you know, the madness of crowds. This wasn't the madness of crowds. The crowd was not mad. The bank may have been mad, but the crowd was perfectly rational. They said, look, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the free lunch is over. Let's pull our money out. Uh, for, uh, what we want now is not to uh, hope for a, uh, and pray for a 4.2% return. Let's just move for safety. Uh, if you have a billion dollars, you're more concerned with keeping that billion dollars safe than uh, actually making uh, an income on it. And uh, I think that's what happened. And when you say up to, yeah, that's uh, funny language. And uh, Michael, I know uh, you, you're friends with um, Pam Martins and Russ Martins over at Wall Street on Parade that always do great reporting. They've done a wonderful job of following all of this. And, and they, they see if there's anyone who shouldn't be bailed out, it's the, uh, uh, it's the wealthy billionaire depositors of, uh, of that bank. Yeah, they describe Silicon Valley Bank as a Wall Street IPO pipeline in drag as a federally insured bank. And I just want to read what they wrote here, which really summarizes it very well. SVB was a financial institution deployed to facilitate the goals of powerful venture capital and private equity operators by financing tech and pharmaceutical startups until they could raise millions or billions of dollars in a Wall Street initial public offering and IPO. And you mentioned, uh, Michael, that the U.S. Treasury Secretary um, Janet Yellen claimed that, that the U.S. government is not going to bail out uh, the depositors, these private equity firms and such and startups at SVB. But in reality, only $250,000 of their deposits were actually federally insured. But we were seeing that actually the U.S. government is ensuring that all of their deposits, including above $250,000, is going to be paid to them. So essentially, what the Federal Reserve, backed by the Treasury with a $25 billion war chest in, in supporting this operation, what they're essentially saying is that there is that deposit insurance on commercial banks in the United States, including ones with very high interest, uh, interest bearing deposits. It's basically infinity. There is no limit on federally insured accounts. It's no longer actually two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which only incentivizes other firms in the future to deposit their their earnings into very risky banks that offer very high interest rates they can't pay out because they know that the U.S. government will bail them out. Well, Janet Yellen also said that Ukraine was going to win the war with uh, Russia. Uh, <laughs> I think she's a, uh, sort of the uh, reincarnation of Pinocchio. Uh, of, you're never going to have a Federal Reserve head uh, uh, say that there's going to be a problem. You're never uh, bankers uh, are not allowed to tell the truth. Uh, that's why one one of the uh, worst thing that can happen to a banker uh, is that they get COVID because when you get COVID, sometimes you're not able to lie quickly, uh, and uh, uh, it's a surefire way of losing the job. That's part of it. But but there's another reason. Uh, if you have a, a banker describe, uh, be aware of the systemic risk that I just explained, uh, the risk that, that is for the whole economy, if it ever tries to go back to normal, which it, it can't again without causing a crisis, uh, then you're disqualified for the job or you're called overqualified. Uh, in order to be a bank uh, examiner or a bank regulator, you have to believe that uh, every problem can be kicked down the road. Uh, that uh, there are automatic stabilizers and the market is going to solve everything uh, thanks to the magic of the marketplace. Uh, and if you don't believe that, uh, you're uh, uh, blackballed uh, and are never going to be uh, promoted. So uh, <laughs> the last person you're ever going to want to explain any, uh, anything, uh, whether it's Alan Greenspan or uh, uh, his successors, uh, is uh, the, the head of the Federal Reserve. Michael, I want to talk about the scheme that the Federal Reserve has created in order to bail out uh, Silicon Valley Bank and its clients without calling it a bailout. And uh, I'm going to look at a very good thread that was done by the post-Keynesian economist Daniela Gabor. Gabor and um, 
she she she's tweeted that she has spent 15 years researching central banks collateral and she has never heard of a single central banker contest the, the, the common wisdom that there should be uh, haircuts. Instead, what we see is the Fed is paying par value. So it, the Fed has this program called the Bank Term Funding Program. And essentially, it's giving ex extremely favorable loans to uh, Silicon Valley Bank and other banks, and which are essentially government subsidies. And in, instead of using as collateral the treasury securities and other assets that are owned owned by Silicon Valley Bank, or at least that were, instead of using their market value, the Federal Reserve is using the value at par, the face value that was printed on the treasury securities that are held by, the, by Silicon Valley Bank and other banks that need to be bailed out. So essentially what they're saying is that only average working people are subject to the, the discipline of the market. But banks, they don't actually have to go along with market value for their securities. They can be bailed out with these with by using as collateral the values of what they originally bought the security at before the Fed raised interest rates and the price of those bonds decreased. So in short, what it is, is socialism for the rich, for big corporations and for the commercial banks and capitalism for everyone else. Um, well, that's Daniela said Gabor said she's never seen this in 15 years of research. Do you agree? Have you ever seen something like this? Well, this is what I said at the very beginning uh, of our discussion today. I said the banks are able to carry their uh, uh, their assets at the price they purchased it at. That was called the book value, uh, not the current uh, market value. Well, if, if uh, for years in the 60s and 70s, uh, if you had uh, banks uh, carrying their real uh, or a comp corporation carrying real estate at market at book value, uh, people were looking over these balance sheets saying, aha, they're going to uh, uh, value their real estate at what they bought it for in the 1950s, and now it's tripled in value. Let's let's raid that corporation and take it over, break it up, and sell the real estate. That was how money was made in the 60s and 70s and even more in the 80s. Uh, but uh, that's when uh, asset prices are going up. But uh, when you uh, mark to uh, uh, purchase price uh, uh, book value instead of uh, the market value, uh, you're going to have uh, this disparity. That's exactly the problem. Uh, and uh, you're quite right about the double standard that the government has. Uh, look at the double standard with uh, the student loan debtors. Uh, they are unable uh, to pay their uh, student loans without making a big sacrifice. Uh, but uh, Biden uh, has made sure that uh, uh, they're not going to be bailed out uh, because he's the man who sponsored uh, the bankruptcy bill saying that uh, student loans are not subject to bankruptcy uh, laws to be written down. Uh, every other kind of asset, if you go bankrupt, can be written down to the current market value for what you owe, but not student loans. Uh, they're kept uh, sacros sac sacrosanct. So uh, there's a diametric uh, opposite uh, economic philosophy when it comes to what uh, wage earners and consumers uh, uh, owe and uh, uh, what uh, the, the uh, financial and real estate sector owes. Uh, the Biden administration and the Republicans say that no uh, billionaire should lose a single penny. No bank or real estate company should loan, uh, owe anything. We will uh, guarantee to bail out that they are risk-free. We've transferred all of the risk onto the voters who have put us in power. Uh, because we say that uh, maybe you'll be a billionaire someday. You don't want to hurt them, do you? Or whatever their uh, politic politicking is. So uh, uh, this, this double standard is uh, uh, what is squeezing the economy now by not uh, uh, making uh, the uh, not permitting the uh, financial sector from taking a penny loss. Somebody has to lose, and the losers are the non-financial economy, the real economy of production and consumption. Michael, another factor in this is crypto. While, while this is happening, it's, it's also in the wake of a disastrous collapse in big parts of the cryptocurrency industry. You yourself has, have always been very skeptical and have criticized this crypto industry, and you can talk about that. I mean, I've done many interviews with you over the years. Going back on the record, people can see that you were proven right about this. 
Um, of course, Silicon Valley Bank, as its name suggests, is, is definitely involved in the tech sector in Silicon Valley. But before SVB collapsed, we Silver saw Lake. Silvergate collapsed. Mm -hmm. And Silvergate was very heavily invested, or at least many of its depositors were companies invested in crypto. And then on March 12th, there was another bank that went down, which, which unlike SVB and Silvergate, those were in California. The third bank to go down was Signature Bank, which is based in New York City. And 30%, almost one third of Signature Bank's deposits were cryptocurrency businesses. So maybe you can talk about crypto's role in all of this. And of course, this comes at a time when um, Sam Bankman fried the um, fraudster who ran F the FDX exchange. He was exposed to the world for committing literal fraud and losing billions of dollars in really overnight. Well, the whole mythology and fantasy of crypto uh, has been burst, uh, especially with uh, uh, Banks Friedman. Uh, crypto was supposed to be, they called it peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer lending was uh, the person who bought the uh, crypto uh, took money out of the bank and paid for crypto with a, a bank transfer fee was called one peer. Who's the other peer? The other peer was uh, Bankman Freed, and he could do whatever he wanted with his money. Uh, and uh, the crypto uh, cover story was, well, uh, we know that uh, the economy's messed up and uh, we don't like big government and we don't like the bank. So here's an alternative to the banks, uh, putting your money in a bank and putting your money uh, depending on government fiat currencies. Well, what? Uh, uh, so people would put their money into crypto thinking this is something different from the banks. And yet it turns out, what did the crypto companies do? If you get a billion dollars of uh, inflow by people who want an alternative, what are you going to do with the billion dollars? Well, uh, Bankman Freed simply bought luxury real estate and uh, uh, gave it uh, uh, money to the Democratic and uh, party and a few Republicans uh, for campaign contributions to buy influence. But most of the crypto was put in the ba uh, Silvergate uh, Bank and uh, other banks or in government securities. I mean, where else are you going to put a billion dollars inflow? Uh, uh, you get a bank transfer from a bank. It goes into your uh, bank account. Uh, you have to have a bank account somewhere to hold it. And uh, what do you do? The money that goes into crypto ends up in the very banks or the government securities that crypto is supposed to be an escape from. So all of crypto is is a disguised uh, bank or uh, mutual fund uh, that has its money in banks and government securities, uh, except that has secrecy so that if you're a criminal or a tax uh, evader or a, a crook and you don't want the government to uh, uh, to know what you have, uh, you, you're you willing to give a premium, just like the uh, cocaine cartel will pay 10% or 20% uh, for money laundering. Crypto was a vast money laundering uh, uh, operation uh, wrapped in an idealization, that a fantasy that it was an alternative to banks and uh, government uh, uh, money, when of course the backing for uh, the crypto was banks and government money. Uh, uh, e exactly. Well, obviously, when people begin to realize this and saying, wait a minute, who who uh, is running the cryptocurrency that we're holding? Uh, we don't know uh, what it is because it's uh, crypto. Uh, it's, uh, that's why it's called crypto. It can't be regulated because the government can't know what's in it or who's uh, paying what because it's crypto. So there's no way of regulating crypto. And uh, needless to say, uh, every mafiosi, every uh, sort of financial crook finds uh, it's like taking uh, candy from a baby. Uh, from uh, all you have to do is say that we have a, an idealistic uh, libertarian uh, answer to socialism. So crypto was uh, the libertarian answer to socialism. And uh, it, uh, we've seen, I, I think socialism won that, uh, uh, that particular uh, fight. And uh, uh, the banks, of course, uh, when people were selling the crypto, the cryptocurrency had to draw on its bank account. Uh, and uh, when it drew on its bank account, uh, the banks were left without money and the banks that had to pay the crypto company to pay the crypto seller 
uh, had to sell their bonds and package mortgages and take a capital loss on uh, assets that they were carrying at original book value at purchase price, but they were only getting the market price for it. So the whole unra unraveling uh, of all of this, uh, reality raised its ugly head. Uh, Professor Hudson, you've written an, an article about this, which is why the U.S. banking system is breaking up. I can link to that in the description below. And then you followed up and you said that the U.S. bank crisis is not over and you warned that it could spread. And I, I just want to go over this briefly again, just these, these numbers here, that the biggest bank to ever fail in U.S. history was Washington Mutual. And that was in 2008. Um, during the financial crash, and it had $307 billion in assets. Um, the second biggest bank ever to collapse in U.S. history was Silicon Valley Bank with $209 billion in assets. So pretty close to Washington Mutual. And Signature Bank was the third biggest bank to collapse, which had $118 billion in assets. So clearly there are parallels to the 2008 crash. But in your article, you also pointed out that there are parallels to the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. So what, what can we learn from the 1980s SNL crash and also the 2008 crash? Well, I want to, first of all, challenge uh, what you said about uh, Washington Mutual being uh, uh, the biggest bank to go under. Uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, at all the right way to look at it. The, what, what is important to look at is what banks were insolvent. Uh, Sheila Baer uh, wrote in her autobiography that there was one bank that was worse than all the others, that was totally insolvent, uh, not only uh, incompetently managed but crooked. That bank was Citibank. Uh, but Citibank was looked over by Obama's uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, who, had pro who uh, worked with uh, Bob Rubin, who was uh, uh, the protector of Citibank. So uh, the fact is that not only Citibank, uh, Citicorp, uh, but all the big banks, uh, Sheila Bear, the, who was head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, said the banks were insolvent. So uh, she was pressing. She said, look, uh, Citibank should go under. Let's clean it up. Let's take it uh, under and clean out the crooks. Uh, and uh, Geithner said, no, the crooks are us. Uh, you know, that's our game. So uh, the the key to look at isn't what banks actually were permitted to go under, uh, the, uh, the uh, really crooked banks like Washington Mutual, but what banks were insolvent. Uh, Citibank and its, uh, uh, what were the others? Uh, Wells Fargo, she mentioned. Uh, these were the banks that had uh, uh, the junk mortgages, uh, Bank of America. Uh, the, the, the banks were insolvent. And when I say that uh, the problem is just beginning, uh, it's just beginning because the problem that the financial sector and the banking sector has today is endemic to finance capitalism. And uh, the charts that I've made in uh, Killing the Host and uh, other, and also in uh, uh, the destiny of civilization, any uh, uh, the, the financial sector grows by interest bearing debt. And that's an exponential system. Any interest rate is a doubling time. Any interest rate goes exponentially. But the economy doesn't keep track. It goes on an S curve and it goes slower and slower and then it turns down. That's the business cycle. And it's like a, it depicted as a kind of sine curve up and down. The, the problem is that the, uh, the, the economy can't keep pace with the uh, ability, uh, uh, with the debts that it owes. The ability to pay to, uh, ex exponentially rising debt does not uh, uh, keep pace with uh, this growth of debt. And uh, that uh, makes and a collapse inevitable. Uh, this uh, disparity between the growth curves of debt and the growth curve of the economy uh, has been known for uh, 5,000 years. It was already documented in Babylonia uh, in uh, 1800 BC. We, we have the textbooks, the mathematical textbooks that uh, scribes were tra uh, trained in. Antiquity knew this. Uh, Aristotle talked about it. Uh, 
everybody knows about this, but uh, it's, it's not taught as part of the uh, uh, financial curriculum. The financial sector grows by different mathematical laws than the economy grows in. And uh, that's what makes it uh, uh, inevitable. Uh, the savings and loan crisis uh, was somewhat different. Uh, uh, it, it is worth mentioning uh, because much of it was uh, uh, the result of uh, fraud, again, as Bill Black has explained. Uh, but here was the problem in, in the savings and loans and savings banks. Uh, and I, I discussed this in the article that uh, you just cited. Uh, the savings banks and SNLs lent uh, mortgage money. And uh, they would uh, uh, basically, when I was working uh, uh, in the 1960s, interest rates were going up from about 3.5% uh, to 4.5% for mortgages. And uh, the banks would uh, take deposits and they'd pay maybe a uh, uh, two and a half percent interest, and they'd make loans at three and a half percent for a thirty-year mortgage. So uh, all of this sort of happened normally until uh, the late 1970s. And uh, in the late 1970s, uh, because of the uh, uh, Vietnam War, the interest rates uh, steadily rose because the U.S. balance of payments uh, was getting squeezed. And finally, uh, uh, you had an inflation because of the war-induced so uh, shortages. Pentagon capitalism. And uh, so Paul Volcker raised the interest rates to 20%. Well, imagine what happened. Uh, uh, they, uh, even though they came down af from 20% after uh, 1980, they were still very high. Well, here's the situation. The uh, say SNLs were in the much the same uh, situation that uh, uh, bank depositors uh, were in uh, in the last uh, few years. Uh, you could get a low, very low rate of interest from the banks or a high rate of interest by putting your money in government securities or corporate bonds or even junk bonds uh, that were paying uh, a lot of money. So people uh, uh, took the money uh, out of the banks and uh, bought higher yielding uh, financial securities. Well, uh, the banks were squeezed because the banks could not pay. Uh, when interest rates went up to 6%, 7% for mortgages, uh, uh, banks couldn't simply uh, charge their uh, mortgage customers more because the mortgage customer had a 30-year loan at a fixed rate of interest. So there was no way the banks could earn enough money to pay uh, the high interest rates that were in the rest of the economy. And as a result, they were pushed under and uh, the uh, commercial banks had a field day. Uh, Sheila Baer told me that uh, uh, the banks uh, raped the, she didn't use that word, the savings bank. She said they said they were going to uh, uh, provide more money for savings banks depositors. And what they did was empty it all out and just pay themselves higher salaries. So th there are uh, I think no more savings banks, no more, hardly any more uh, SNLs. They were all cannibalized by the large Wall Street banks, uh, emptied out uh, as a result, and uh, uh, that uh, transformed the financial structure and the banking structure of the American economy. Well, that transformation and that squeeze uh, of getting rid of a whole class of banks uh, is now threaten, threatening uh, the smaller banks uh, in the United States, uh, com the smaller commercial banks, because uh, they're in uh, the situation of being sort of left behind uh, in the sense that if, if only the largest banks are too big to fail. In other words, there are such big campaign contributors, and they have so many of their uh, ex-officials running the Treasury or serving as Treasury officials or going into Congress or buying congressmen uh, that uh, th uh, they're safe. And people who have their money in smaller banks like uh, Silicon Valley and uh, the others you've mentioned uh, are nowhere near as safe as the too-big-to-fail banks. So if a bank's not too big to fail, then it's small enough to fail, and you really don't want to keep more than $250,000 there because that's not insured, and uh, you don't know how long uh, Biden can get away with uh, bailing out uh, the wealthy depositors and just sticking it uh, to the uh, uh, to the rest of the economy. Uh, uh, at, at some point, uh, he just can't be a crook anymore. <laughs> uh, Michael, you've emphasized that after the 2008 crash, one of, in addition to bailing out the big banks and all of this and the idea of too big to fail, one of the ways that the U.S. had a so-called recovery, although you've pointed out it wasn't really recovery, is through quantitative easing. 
And you can see quantitative easing really is a kind of drug for the economy where money was so cheap, um, interest rates were so low that, it, it, I mean, now that interest rates are rising, the federal funds rate is going up, it makes it more expensive to get money. And this, this bubble that was created by the Fed is, is beginning to burst. And you've argued that this is maybe going to push them back toward quantitative easing. Um, although Jerome Powell has insisted that he's potentially going to continue increasing the federal funds rate. And, and that if was he, on Friday, he said that. Yesterday, he withdrew. He said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We crashed the banks. Never mind. Never mind. We're, we're going, uh, now that I realize that it's not, I'm not only hurting labor, but I'm hurting our constituency. The 1%, of course, we're going to roll it back. We're not going to, don't worry, 1%. Give your money to the party. We're going to, uh, uh, we're going to make everything okay for you. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at a graph of asset price inflation, we see that it seems like the economy in the U.S. is at a point where it's so financialized and it relies so much on these bubbles that it can't, it doesn't seem like it can survive without low interest rates and without quantitative easing. So you've argued that this crisis is here to stay. There needs to be fundamental systemic change. It's going to either be stagflation with can, with the continuation of these policies of, of QE and low interest rates, or it's going to be economic crisis like we're seeing now. This is the corner into which the Fed has uh, uh, painted itself. This is, uh, we're in the culminating uh, part of the Obama depression. This is what Obama set, uh, uh, set in motion by bailing out the banks and supporting the banks instead of the economy as a whole. Uh, Obama and uh, uh, Geithner and uh, Obama's uh, uh, cabinet declared war on the economy by the uh, 1%. And that's the amazing thing is that the economy doesn't see uh, how dangerous what he did was and uh, how uh, consciously uh, he uh, sold out uh, the voters that had put their trust in him to do everything he could uh, to hurt them because the degree to which he could hurt the economy was the degree to which the 1% and the 10% was able to make the killing that you just showed in the asset price inflation chart. So uh, there's uh, uh, this is not the class interest that Marx talked about. It's not the uh, uh, class interest of employers versus wage earners. It's uh, uh, the financial class and real it's allied real estate and insurance class, the fire sector against the economy at large, the real economy of production and consumption. That, that is uh, what we're seeing. And something has to give. And uh, in every case, uh, both the Republicans and the Democrats say, if something has to give, we're willing to shrink the economy in order to protect the, the financial insurance and real estate sector uh, from taking a loss, because that's uh, where the 10 percent have its uh, uh, its uh, assets. We're not in industrial capitalism anymore. We're in finance capitalism. And the way that finance capitalism is work works is very different from the dynamics uh, of industrial capitalism as uh, was forecast in the 19th century. Uh, Michael, as we start to wrap up here, I want to ask you about corruption. Um, this is something that you mentioned in, in your articles analyzing the SVB crash and other bank crash, other um, banks crashing. Um, you talk about campaign financing, which you addressed, but also regulatory capture is, I think, an important point. And you wrote that to, to understand this, we should look at who the bank regulators, bank regulators and examiners are. They are vetted by the banks themselves, chosen for their denial that there is any inherent structural problem in our financial system. They are true believers that financial markets are self-correcting by automatic stabilizers. Talk about the concept of regulatory capture and how really it's just corruption, but we don't call it that because the U.S. acts as though other countries are corrupt, but the U.S. isn't corrupt. Well, the center of this corruption, again, uh, uh, my colleague Bill Black has explained this. The federal, if you notice, uh, who were the bank regulators over uh, the Silicon Valley and the others? The, uh, these banks that have gone under are all regulated by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. If there's any bank board that is totally run by the banks that regulates, 
it's the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Uh, and they, uh, they look at themselves as protecting uh, the banks under uh, their uh, authority. Instead of regulating them, uh, they say, how can we help you uh, make more money? Uh, before that, the most uh, corrupt uh, regulators were uh, the comptroller of the currency uh, group. Now, banks have a, a choice. Uh, banks are able to choose what regulator is going to regulate them. And uh, if you're a banker and you want to be a crook, you know just who to go to. I want to be regulated by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board because I know that they'll always ba they'll let me do anything I want uh, and that uh, they owe their job to the fact that I can get them fired at any time uh, if, if they do something that will not uh, let me... Uh, do whatever I want. If they will try to say that what I'm doing is fraudulent, uh, I'll say this is you're accusing. This is socialism. This is you're regulating the market. This is market regulation. Come on, uh, theft is part of the market. Don't you get that? And the bank regulator said, Ah, yes, you're right. The free market under uh, the uh, libertarian Federal Home Loan Bank Board is fraud is part of the uh, uh, free market. Theft is part of the free market. Anything else is socialism. So, of course, we're not socialists. Of course, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and uh, as long as you have bank regulators like that uh, who, uh, who believe that, the, that uh, uh, no, uh, as Alan Greenspan put it, why would a banker ever cheat somebody? If he cheated somebody, uh, he wouldn't have them as customers anymore. <laughs> well, if you've ever uh, been pickpocketed uh, in Times Square or anywhere else in New York, you notice that the, the pickpocket doesn't say, gee, I better not uh, pick, steal the wallet of this guy because then he'll never trust me again. Well, you're never going to meet the guy again. It's a hit and miss. It's a, a hit and run. Uh, and uh, that's how the uh, financial sector has uh, worked uh, for the last century. And already at the uh, early 20th century, uh, there were critics of uh, how banks were structured, and uh, the British critics especially. Uh, this was during World War I. Uh, the argument came out, well, uh, uh, why, uh, maybe Germany uh, is going to win the war because uh, uh, they have uh, a much more uh, industrially uh, organized banking system. Banks have been industrialized, uh, but the British uh, uh, banks uh, and uh, stockbrokers especially are uh, uh, hit and run and just uh, want a quick payout and uh, uh, leave leave the comp country, company emptied out. Well, the one may, way to make money most quickly if you're a financier in America is asset stripping. Uh, you borrow money, you, you buy out a corporation, you uh, uh, load it down with debt uh, and empty it out and leave it as a bankrupt shell. That's finance capitalism. That is what you're taught to do in business schools. That's how the market economy works. Uh, uh, raid a company, take it over, sell off the wealthy assets, pay yourself a management fee, pay yourself uh, a huge dividend. Uh, this is why uh, I think Bed Bath & Beyond is going under. It's why a whole bunch of companies are going under. Uh, you borrow money, uh, uh, you take over a company, you let the company borrow money, you pay it to yourself as the new owner is a, a special dividend, uh, and then you leave uh, the company owing a debt with no, uh, uh, no current income, able to cover the debt, and it goes bankrupt. Uh, and you say, well, that's the market. Uh, and of course, it doesn't have to be the market. It doesn't have to be this way, but that's the way in which the market is structured. And you'd think that this is the kind of thing that academic economics courses would uh, teach about. But instead of uh, teaching people how to make an alternative to this and how to avoid this kind of uh, ripoff economy and uh, smash and grab economy, uh, they show you how to do it. Uh, so... Uh, given the way in which uh, public consciousness is taught and uh, the skill of financial lobbyists and telling people that they're getting rich to borrow more money, uh, to buy a house as uh, price is going to go up and up, if only they take on more and more debt. Uh, if people imagine that uh, the economy is recovering by uh, taking on debt uh, to make housing more expensive and uh, stocks and bonds and uh, hence a retirement income more expensive, then uh, you're living in an inside out world that turns out to be a nightmare. Well, to conclude here, Michael, my last question is where you think we should be keeping an eye on the US economy, what other financial institutions could be next? You wrote in your, uh, in your analysis that 
the Biden administration is simply kicking the can down the road until the 2024 election, that these are fundamental systemic problems. And there may very well be more banks that crash in the next weeks, months, years. So where should we be looking? And what's the final word you want to leave us with? The word is derivatives. That's what we didn't talk about. There are $80 trillion of derivatives. That is bets, uh, uh, casino bets on uh, whether uh, interest rates will go up or down, whether bond prices will go up or down. And uh, there's been a, a, a a gigantic uh, increase in the volume of bets that banks have made, maybe a hundred times as large as it was back in 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons it uh, could grow so much is with interest rates of almost zero, uh, people could borrow uh, from the bank and essentially go to the races and uh, make bets on currencies, uh, exchange rates, interest rates. But now that interest rates are beginning to go up, it costs more to make the bets. And even if you bet right on a derivative, uh, you can put down a penny and buy a hundred, make a, a buy a hundred dollar uh, bond and uh, bet that this bond is going to re go up one penny. And if it goes up one penny, uh, you've doubled your money. But if it goes down one penny, then you've lost it all. Uh, this is the kind of uh, this is what happens when you have a high leveraged uh, bet on uh, derivatives or something else. And uh, the derivatives are the uh, uh, what uh, everybody's worried about because there's no real accounting for them. We just know that I think Chase has uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has maybe 58 billion in derivatives. Uh, Ellen Brown has just written a wonderful article on derivatives that's uh, all over the internet. And uh, uh, she's a lawyer uh, as well as a bank reformer. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the next big uh, crash is going to be some bank that's made a wrong bet in derivatives and uh, the wrong bet has just wiped out all the bank capital. What is going to happen then? That's the next, uh, uh, as they say, shoe that is going to fall. Well, Michael, I want to thank you so much for joining us to explain these important topics. And not only um, just for joining us, but for joining us specifically on your birthday. Happy birthday. It's a real pleasure. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, I want to invite everyone to go check out Michael's website at michael-hudson.com. There you can find links to his articles, to his books. And I will link in the description below to the articles that he's written specifically about the crash of Silicon Valley Bank and other financial institutions. And finally, what I'll say is that um, I will also invite everyone to check out the show that Michael hosts every two weeks with friend of the show, Radhika Desai. They have a show together that's called Geopolitical Economy Hour, and it's hosted here at Geopolitical Economy Report. And in the link in the, in the description below, I will include a link to a playlist where people can find all of their, their episodes there explaining uh, the intricacies of e economics and geopolitics. Um, Michael, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Well, I, I'm glad uh, we discussed this in a timely fashion because all of this is unfolding so rapidly that who knows what the story will be next week. Absolutely. So it's we always benefit from this uh, very timely analysis from you. Thanks a lot.